Okay, this is Vaughan at westcoatbellpottery.ca in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, I'm going to do a video on uh, organization and timing yourself throughout the day so that you, know, you can have a, a hopefully a profitable day um, that is economical and efficient. Um, so this is La Have in Nova Scotia. It's a beautiful day. Um, a lot of people would say you should be out sailing, but I don't do boating. But it is a beautiful day. It's uh, August 28th. All right, so um, let's get cracking. Okay, after I came down into the studio, the first job I had to do today was to actually finish coating these mugs. Uh, these are two stencil resist mugs. Uh, I just did the video on the black and white you know, dog mugs. Um, but these ones are all rabbits and cats, just with a stencil and white clay and then sprayed a different color background. And I had none of these left in the gallery, so, um, so I decided to make them. I only ever make them once a year, but today was the day, or yesterday was the day. And I just, I just airbrushed them. You can dip these, but I found the handles can fall off if you dip and you get it a bit too thick. Um, so it's easier to airbrush them. And, uh, and basically now I just cut up some clay um so i've got an order from white point resort to make 24 mugs so i got all those cut up there and i'm going to set up throwing on the wheel and i will probably have a lot of company because there's some pro crows outside and um so uh, it'll be noisy well i'm sitting at the wheel and i remembered that i have some trimming to do today as well so that's another job i've got to fit in um of course that has to be done right when they're leather hard so it trims easy um so when you are scheduling your day you've got to kind of spend five to five minutes just thinking about things what is you know what's the order of things have to be done to make things efficient and um, and not get past a certain point that you need things to be as far as dampness and softness um so be careful about what you schedule every day and everything goes wrong you know, especially if you have a retail operation too, where I have two cameras right here uh, in my gallery over there that I have to watch when somebody needs help over there as well. So it's up and down, up and down. Anyway, I'm gonna throw some mugs now, so here we go. This is a mug that I make for White Point that just says White Point on it. Um, I don't think we need extra light here. No, that's not made any difference. The crows may squawk a little bit while we're doing this. Put some power on. This is a Shimpo Whisper. It's the wheel I like to throw on, but I have wheels for each color of clay. Um, it's because I use red clay, I use iron clay for stoneware, and I use speckled clay, and I use white clay. And I try not to mix them up on the wheels, because obviously the clay can be affected by that. Um, let's get... Uh, it's also a good idea to cover your clay up with plastic when you're throwing. So I just covered all this lot down here with a sheet of plastic because um, over the hour that it's going to take me to throw 24 mugs, um, the last ones will end up with the edges a little bit dry, especially since I don't bang them into balls. All right, so I put a piece of plastic over there. All right, first one. If you don't bang them into balls, you have to round off the edges like that because this is brand new 516 stoneware from Pottery Supply House in uh, Ontario. Um, the wheel is dampened, I press it down. This bat's a little warped, uh, but I like throwing it because it's got a little ridge on the edge. Uh, so when I'm cutting things off, it actually uh, lets the water stay on the wheel instead of coming off at the edges. That's from heating the bat up with a torch once and it made it swell a little bit at the edge. But this is centering and I didn't kind of explain how I did that, so here we go. You have a bowl of clay that wobbles. You put your elbow against something solid if you can, and I'm too far away. If you can move your wheel just a touch to the actual edge of the wheel and you can jam your elbow against a wall. I built this thing right next to a wheel so that I could do that. It's just a wall I would jam my elbow in. You can center a lot easier. And of course everybody knows how to center. <laughs> but that's basically an equal amount of pressure top and sideways to stop it wobbling. There's even a light wobble there, you see? So that's better. But anyway, to put a hole in you make a dimple 
feel for the center and don't go all the way in because you might push in off center right from that get go. But put a dimple if it isn't on center, if you feel like it's still wobbling, it's easy at that point just to kind of re get rid of that dimple center again and go for it again. But try to feel for the center and don't press down until you actually feel like you've, you've got your fingertip right on the point of center and then you press down, but put some water in there so you can go right to the bottom. Leave about half a centimeter or a quarter of an inch and pull across like that. Don't let it dry out. And I always work my finger from along the base there to, to kind of compress that bottom a little bit. And then move to this side and with your fingertips like this see they they're not level like that they're like that and this finger is slightly at an angle so that the clay hits there and goes over there and then up and you, that's how you raise the wall and these fingers are just kind of fitting so the clay slides in between and the same at 45 degrees the clay hits there then it's there and then goes up so you're making the clay go up put water on Put the position and then raise your finger and make sure your wheel is spinning so that you don't dry the clay out before you get to the top so you can slow the wheel down i did it very fast there to show you but you just slow the wheel down to touch so that when you're going you only actually rotate on one level one rotation before you're a bit higher so you go to the bottom and the wheel's slower now so this time i will chase the wet spot and it will stay wet all the way to the top and then let go slowly. But if you ever feel it dragging, you need to let go and get some water on it. But let go slowly. Water on the rim, hand goes in, push out at the bottom, because I want these to have my traditional sort of shape. And then when you get to the top, you let go slowly. And the fingers get to the top, sort of like that, still at that angle. Now using your rib, make a little groove for the wire can get under easier. And she wants to have white points stamped on the bottom of these, so I'm gonna to have to have a fairly decent size bottom there. You're gonna take your rib. We can get rid of that big bulgy belly a little bit then. I think I'm going to widen that little bit down there a bit. That was sticking out too far. But I am going to aim to make 24 mugs this shape. I'm going to make that little area to be stamped a little more defined there. I've noticed that if you make that stick out too far, people chip it. And so you don't want this to stick out much further than the mug, otherwise it will actually be caught. As people put a mug down, they judge from what they're seeing is the mug, but the foot sticks out a little bit further, and you'll end up with people coming back saying, I chipped my mug. And then you get a sponge on the stick. And you suck out all the water. This clay body is super smooth. It's 516 stone, whereas I said, so I don't need to use my leather on the rim because it is so smooth and creamy anyway, and there's no grit to lift to the surface. And there you go. There's a little bit of moisture on there. You can take that off. That's a mug. Put water all the way around. I always clean the wheel before I put the water around and take your wire, spin the wheel slowly and pull it towards you and the, wheel, and the pot will release and you pull it off. There's lots of ways of taking pots off the wheel, but you're simply looking for a mug like that. I'll do another one. But it isn't really a throwing video, so you can go to my beginner throwing videos. I think I had one called the ultimate throwing, the beginner throwing video. Now if you're having trouble centering, just cone it a little bit so it gets taller. 
and then push it down. And sometimes you can actually center a little easier if you do that. Starting to dry now and drag. So get some water. And let go when it's centered. Put your dimple in. It's still wet, so I'm going to go for it. Go down. It's still wet, so I'm pulling out. So let go because it was drying out. So if you go fast enough, you see, you don't need to keep going back and forwards to get water. And that's the goal, is you get good enough so you can do that all in one movement. I generally throw about 24 to 26 mugs in an hour if I haven't been disturbed. And I know I can throw faster than that if I make smaller, simpler mugs. Where I generally get two pulls to get my mug height. Let go slowly and put a little pressure on the rim to even it and smooth it. A little group on the bottom. That's where my lettering is going to be. That's a bit nicer than the last one. Dribble water all the way down. My hand was just dipped in the bucket of water, so it's wet. And then I pull up. Fingertip is right against the rib, go all the way up, and then put my extra groove in. Let go slowly, skip up about a quarter of a, an inch or an eighth of an inch to give you that double lip, tankard lip as some people call it. Get rid of your water on the inside, pull the sponge all the way up, roll it over. I need a new sponge actually, this one's getting kind of worn. And that's it. That's the mug in real time. You can kind of see the, where the stamping is going to be. Water's dribbled around it. Slowly rotate, pull the wire through, pull the mug off, let go slowly. Okay, that's all the mugs thrown. Um, so this is what we have. I have a whole table full of mugs there all thrown. I got some balls of clay there to pull some handles. I've got the mugs I decorated yesterday, which I finished up uh, coloring today. And then I also have, from two days ago, a whole bunch of little trivets, um, that are 48 of those, uh, that I now have to trim as well. So what I have to do is four different things. So you schedule according to the dryness of the clay. And the first thing I have to do is pull handles for those mugs. And then these are actually ready for trimming. So I've got to get to those and trim. And while I'm trimming those, the mugs are drying out. Um, and then at some point at the end of the day, I'll turn those mugs upside down and actually uh, take the stencils off if I get time. Uh, but the stencil removing might be tomorrow morning. So pulling handles, I've wedged this clay a little bit just to make sure it's nice. I'm doing it on my wheel, making sure I don't turn the wheel on, obviously. <laughs> I have done that. I have had my water spin everywhere. But anyway, um, that was by accident. I stepped on the foot pedal. So pulling handles, big piece of clay, weighs about two pounds, maybe one and a half to two pounds. I should be able to get close to 20 handles out of this. And I have another piece of clay there as a backup. Make sure you, you pull that little nubbin that builds up at the bottom. You pull that every so often, you pull down several times, just on that little piece there. And then you snap them off. Place it in the middle. And I'm gonna try and pull about 12 or 11 either side of that piece so I can keep track count, counting wise without having to count 20 each time to see how many I've got.
Okay, I've assessed that the trimming is the first thing that needs to be done next, and these are some little dishes I made yesterday using that stencil technique I just showed the Black Labs. Um, and I simply have this foam bat with circles drawn on it so that I can put something in the middle and know that it's centered pretty quickly without um, tap centering or using the dipping grip. Because everybody can make one of these foam bats. I mean, they're, it's just a regular bat with a, a piece of yoga mat basically glued to it. So I used some spray adhesive on the actual wooden bat and then glued this foam yoga mat piece to it. I just simply cut a circle out and that's it. So using the metal rib and then I turn it over. You don't have to do this if you don't want to because you can just leave it. You could paint a little edge here if you wanted to but oh no I can't do that. I'm going to use the Giffen grip for that. So place it down, pretty much you can center it very quickly, just by eye if you've got those little lines drawn on it. Just put a little foot on it. Hardly any trimming needed for these, just down to the edge. And then using the little metal scraper. Everybody has one of these in every toolkit they sell you at the craft stores. It's a little metal but it does a nice job of smoothing the bottom. And that's it, that's all the trimming he does. And then you can trim the rims on the other side if you want to, or you can just paint a different color slip or underglaze, whatever, for the edging. Um, I'm just gonna trim it to white after I've got all the bottoms done. So a nice piece of foam from your I guess the pharmacy sells these, you know, chemist maybe, or the exercise shop, whatever you go to. And that's all you need to do today. Okay, trimmed all the bottoms of all 48, so now I've got a good choice. I can either trim the extra rim a bit over there off and get it really white which I like so I do it this way or you could just get an underglaze and paint a different color rim on each piece but I like the you know the whiteness of this and I do them blue and white and I also have a, a misty glaze that I put on these so, so I'm going to do them all this way so what it entails is just propping them in there this is the Giffen grip you can buy a Bailey version of this as well I just knock off that little bit of extra. So that's that's very easy. There you are, you're a little closer now. Put a better angle here. So squish down the end of the handle. It's already soft on that part where it's gonna go. I just basically forming it. Make sure it's straight down. Folding a little bit off. Holding it up, that little bit that I took off becomes a wedge, which I stick in between there. And that gives me a little extra support at the bottom. The thicker the part at the top is actually fine. 
It's just I've always noticed the bottom of the handle is it always ends up with this little thinner piece, so I'm building up thicknesses. So the same again. Pushed in. I judge it with about three three fingers width. Take a look to make sure it's vertical. Fold it over, make a wedge. Stick it in there. Fold it over, squish it out. Stick it on. Move it up and down. So the mug is actually really soft, just like the handle at this point, at that location. But the rest of the mug is fairly dry because, um, you know, I allowed them to dry. I just wet the area where the handle's going to go. Where I didn't have to do any scoring and scratching. And this is a very smooth stoneware. There's no grit in it whatsoever. So if you can get away with doing that with these, it will work for just about any clay. Porcelain is always difficult to work with. But then I take my big brush. Stick it right opposite the bottom of the handle. Smudge it, smudge it out. The handle, it, the, the brush on the inside is to give some pressure back. So I'm pushing it with my thumb, pressing either side, and the brush on the inside stops it from squashing the mug in. And then I take my little brush here and I press it down into that little wedge. Go down on the other side, I have to come in from the other side to get that smooth. And then I take the back of the paintbrush and use that to model the plastic handle as like a modeling tool to squish that handle in. And if I was going to add slip to these, I would thicken that up at the top as well, but I'm not doing slip on these. Water again, model it. I do the bottom first because water sometimes dribbles down from the handle, from this to the bottom there, and would, would kind of maybe make it not stick. Because water, I actually remember, is a lubricant too unless it's worked into clay. So I do the bottom first, model it down, come in from this side on that part, and on that side from there, smooth it back in a bit. More water, then I do the top. And then come in across the top from both sides smudging it to the center, which I'll have a little thumb ball there anyway in a minute, but um, going down, making sure the water doesn't get between the clay that is being joined. And around, underneath, around again. The handle is not super slippery, so it drags clay with it as you're rubbing the clay with the, with the end of the handle. And so they're all joined now, but I take the other bit of the paintbrush, the ferrule, and I'm smooth now all the way, all around all my joints and down the handle. Oh, get, me, get rid of all those fingerprints. And then just your shaping, basically. And that's why you're trying to aim for the handle to be a little stiffer in the middle than it is at the ends, because you can actually hold the handle will hold itself up even though you're really rubbing with a paintbrush full of water. And then curving to a nice shape. There's lots of curves you can do with handles. I like this one. I've done it forever now. You could even join the bottom. The thick part of the handle could even be on the bottom of the mug too. Everybody should come up with their own 
sort of traditional whatever sort of stylized handle that they use in their potteries. It's nice for identifying work later on. When we're all gone, when they're finding pots in garage sales and hopefully on antique art sites. There you go. Live auctioneers is where we see a lot of our pots being going on the second hand market. If anybody wants to buy some really old pieces by our pottery, just check out live auctioneers. There's some really good deals I've seen on that site. Sometimes a piece gets a really high price, but other times it's, you know, nobody's looking for it at that time. So it all depends. Okay, I just finished putting all of the handles on um it's now 403 so it's getting late in the day um so they're just going to sit for an hour while i actually let them stiffen up a bit so i can put the little uh, plastic cup in the rim uh, but be while i'm doing waiting for that i'm going to stencil remove the mugs okay these are rabbit ones uh, they're now firm enough for me to actually touch them on the bottom as well which means it's good because i can now stencil remove them uh, there is one thing that I have to check on these. Um, underneath the handle is hard to spray when I'm spraying, so I often have to go back just with a paintbrush and just paint a little bit right in that little under the handle area. You can't see much um, at the moment, but after the firing, the slip goes a little bit more. Let's get you as close as I can get you. Okay, so I know I've got rabbits in here, but, and I can tell where they are, but you might not be able to see them very easily. But I use a pin, and if I'm lucky, they come off all in one piece. This one isn't being lucky. And of course I do cats, dogs, horses. Um, horses are horrible to cut stencils, of. but... Um, and birds, I mean, I've done a whole bunch of just these are simplest ones for stencils. But it's all about timing because now the stencil is not going to make a mess if I um, let it fall back into the piece, it won't stick and leave a smudge. And if you leave it too dry, they leave rough edges. So it's about timing. And that's what today's video is all about basically is scheduling your day. So you've got something all the time to do. You don't want to put pressure on yourself, but you, a little bit of pressure is good. Um, but basically, studios are an expensive thing to own. I have a whole building here I have to maintain. Oops, nearly forgot the paint. I have a whole building here I have to maintain, you know, and pay utilities on. So while I'm in here, I have to be producing income to pay for the studio and myself. So I like to have things on the go all the time that are waiting and, be, and just in the right condition when I need them to be. I also do the Scraffito card pieces as a backup. So I have a tray, not a tray, a bat, full of some tiles ready to carve. If I found myself waiting for something, I actually have those to carve. And I think I have 24 of those that I prepared last week for this week so that I'll have something whenever I'm at a, a stop point. It's like in retail. I mean, retail shops are an expensive thing to own. So you've got to sell things to basically pay for the building, but um, my studio is also a very expensive thing to own, especially when the winter's coming. So right in, it's hard to see, but just under there, a little bit of slip, will make it, because that there's a bit of white clay I can see that'll show through after the firing. This one's a cat one. I first did this design back in 1985, and the first piece I made was actually in 1983. 
Um, and I have a, ah, an article in Ceramics Monthly I was in back in 1987, I think it was, doing this technique. It was a, th it was a black and white three-page article about us doing this. I'll see if I can find it and show it in one of the videos. There you go, three little caps. My hand was dusty, but that should wipe right off on the top there. Okay, I finished stencil removing with all my stencils. Um, and the last thing I have to do with this uh, grouping of work today, it's now 4.34 and I was in here this morning at nine o'clock. So it's a long day already. Um, so I dip my cup in a little bit of water and I simply go into each piece and make sure it's back into a circle. Some of them are a little tight but I've got this cup that has two diameters, I guess you'd say. And that's all I have to do. And the last thing, another last thing, is before I put them in the cupboards tonight, I want these to be soft in the morning on the bottom because I have to stamp the letters in. So I'm gonna leave them this way up because they will dry slower at the bottom. Other than, other than that, I would have turned them upside down. Uh, but I actually want these to be softer at the bottom. And that's it for my day's work today. Um, my friend Freddie Moretti uh, from uh, Land Lakes, Florida, um, is, seems to be quite a genius with the old 3D printer, um, which I am not familiar with at all. Uh, but um, from that video I did on making some stilts, uh, he came up with this following little tool. Um, so what he has here is a punch, well, I'll call it a punch, which slides through there. And then this is for the pins uh, to put the little uh, the, the needles in. Um, but all you have to do, and to speed up the process a lot, because I was using a different type of cutter that I had to measure and stuff. Um, but this is a tool which I think will uh, really speed things up. I don't know how many I can get out of here. I'm sure after I've done this a few times, I'll, I'll come up with a really good, efficient way of doing this, but you simply tap it down. There you go. And then pull away the excess. It's like a cookie cutter, basically. And you have a stilt, which isn't even, you can kind of make it a bit smoother even while it's in here, actually. I was going to say we can smooth this later, but if you just do this, first time I've used it, Freddy. Okay, we have a nice smooth piece of clay here. And then let's get this off. And then basically punch it out. Right here. And you've got a still instantly. So that is amazing. That is gonna really speed up making stilts. My, my order of stilts just came in. Um, and so I sadly just got 200 stilts delivered. But in uh, the middle of winter, because the stilts don't last forever anyway, except my stilts seem to be out of this clay body, number 60 from uh, Laguna, um, are lasting longer, I think, than the commercial ones. Um, here are the stilts that I get from National Art Craft in Ohio. They sell them and they just look under their kiln furniture as part of the website. And they send you these little tiny spikes here. And um, so what Freddie's done, he's giving you that groove and then you can push this through. And I just pushed it down. Um, the thickness of this, I would say uh, it could come out a bit. That's a bit close down in there. So I'm not gonna push them as far down as the tool allows you to. Um, and these are sharp on both ends, so you don't have to worry about 
Let's get that so you can see it a bit better. So just place it on to the groove and you get it in the right place each time and just don't press it in as far. And so there you go, to the hole. I guess if you actually glued another piece of cardboard or something to the top of this with, that had a thickness to it of maybe, I don't know, uh, an eighth of an inch, then when you push these in, you would always have them in the same distance each time. But that doesn't really matter anyway, um, because when you're firing them, you know, the, the pot doesn't mind if the stilts are a slightly different height. I guess they might last a bit longer um, if the stilt's a bit further in, but then if you get a glaze run, it might stick easier to the stilt. Now these stilts are $3 each when you buy them. And these are actually a little bit bigger, I think, than uh, the ones I actually have been buying. Uh, I, I buy three different sizes. But that little measuring thing there is great. Makes you get it in at the right place every time. So I think four stilts three six nine twelve dollars um, we could make a lot of those in an hour um, so it, it, this is a very affordable way of making stilts and I have five or six firings on my stilts so far and they look fine they haven't bent over at all so I think uh, number 60 clay from Laguna uh, is a good clay to use for this, but you could also use any grogged stoneware clay, I would say, that doesn't warp when you've got a lot of grog in the clay. And this has a lot of grog in it. But, uh, so it's a three piece set. There you go. Potters are such ingenious people. So thank you, Freddy. Well, the following morning, organizing myself for the day will start all over again because there's the pieces that are left from yesterday um, and the day before, actually. The rabbit mugs were thrown two days ago and decorated yesterday uh, and the cat mugs behind there. Uh, and then the other mugs I have to now stamp with uh, lettering on the bottom when they get dry enough. Um, so because nothing is ready just yet, um, I am going to throw this morning and that's how I schedule the day. You know, take an assessment of what needs to be done and see how I think it will best be achieved throughout the day without any time of, you know, just not having anything to do. All right. Well, it's the end of the day completely now. And basically, I just made a few sales at the gallery. We had a good day of sales at the gallery, so I didn't include those in the video, but that's part of the potter. If you don't go to craft fairs or sell through other galleries, you need to have a retail showroom yourself. Uh, but uh, so it was a busy day. It's getting close to the end of the season. Um, and this lot is waiting to be fired and it's been so humid. It's been packed for five days uh, and it's still it feels damp in there. There's a lot, some more fish and whales in there. There's a whole dinner set, that black and white dog one. I was going to include photographs, but I just couldn't dry the pieces fast enough for posting the video. Um, and I've got a bunch of mugs down there and some butter dishes. The butter dishes are going to be the next video, but... Uh See you next week.